This is a J Mix exclusive. Mm -hmm. Hello all, it's JMix here and I'd like to welcome all my YouTube subs and viewers to a very special guest, Grammy nominated recording engineer, songwriter, producer and mixer, Mr. Jared Scott. Jared Scott has worked with the likes of Rihanna, Pitbull, Little John, Kendrick Lamar and even on Dr. Dre's Detox album. So without any further ado, I'm honored to present part one with Jared Scott. First of all, Jared, I wanted to start by saying thank you. Hey, man, I appreciate you uh, you taking the time. You know, it's it was it's it's kind of a, you know it's a big deal to me to talk on a lot of this stuff. Who inspired you musically? You know, I've I've got to say I've got to say the same as as a lot of other people. You know. Um, Production wise, it'd it'd be Dre, it'd be you know, it'd be Johnny, it'd be uh, you know, Easy Mo B, it'd be uh, Diamond D, you know, all, all, all the classics. Um, you know, I like that that when hip hop was hip hop, you know what I mean? Like when it was, when it was, you know, there's the art to sampling, when there was sampling, when there was you know, digging in crates and you know, real hip hop. Don't get me wrong, I mean Timberland stuff at the moment's banging too, but. Um, you know, the reason I got in in the first place was was Michael Jackson. You know, musically was you know was Tupac. That that just changed my life literally. I mean, I know everyone tells that story, but the first time I heard that man's voice, it was it was it was all over. It was just over. Do you remember what song it was? Oh, I never forget. Never forget. In the, in it's the it's the clearest picture in my mind what happened. My stepsister uh, was in the cool crowd at, at at high school, and she she wouldn't hang out with me, and. There was I, I was I was crushing on a girl like one of her, her girlfriends because they're all the, you know the hot chicks. Anyway, so this 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 girl came over and and had a you know a, a Walkman in and I'm you know I was fourteen or something trying to talk to this seventeen year old girl. I'm like hey 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 uh what are you listening to? And she was like shut up don't talk just listen to this. And of course whatever she said I would do. So I put it in and it was pain from above the rim. And that, I mean it's still to this day it's my favorite it's my favorite song. It's that uh, that's just that's. Oh, that's it right there and then she followed she followed it up with uh ain't no fun which was you know one of the classic snoop joints ever how did you feel about ja rules remix of the song pain i mean it's it's like you you can't remix you know there's always been a, a a standing rule that you can't remix the beatles you know because you can't get any better than than what they did you don't you, you don't do that it's just it's ja rules stop just stop he did he has stopped now but no it was I, you know what i don't think i've listened to the whole song uh all the way through ever it's there it's it's, it's trash and then they did they did one on sorry they did one on the new mix classics too which was trash too there's an unreleased intro to the new mix classics that basically chops up Pac vocals to make him sound like he was dissing Snoop. Have you heard that one? Oh man, if you listen, I mean, you know, there's conspiracy theories floating around and there has been, everyone knows that. If you listen close enough, because obviously because I'm a geek and because I'm an audiophile, if you listen close enough to, to Machiavelli, half the stuff that he says on that, he didn't say. You can t I can hear the edit points. I can hear all the, that's, that's all edits. All that shit's edits. I mean, you know, uh, not all of it, but but if you listen close enough with that and with edits, just with edits in mind, and 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 not listen to the music, which is you know something engineers can do, um, it's it's definitely a hundred percent edited. It doesn't flow like a normal convers like 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 normal speech, you know. No shit, huh? Yeah, it was. There was a lot of that. There's a lot of that going on, man. There was a lot of that going on everywhere with him. Just chop his voice up and make him say whatever you want, which is you know sacrilegious. At least he's not shouting out G unit. Oh, I mean, come on. See, this is the thing that I've, I've always I've had this conversation with you know a thousand people, but you know I'm I'm a white middle aged Australian guy, so no one listens. But ninety percent, and I say ninety percent of the rappers around now, and I know everyone thinks this, but it's I'm just vocalizing. Ninety percent of the rappers wouldn't even have careers. They they wouldn't like Fifty Cent, and this is. I mean, I'm going to go on. 50 Cent's the most overrated rapper in the history of hip hop. I mean, don't get me wrong. He does his thing. He makes a bunch of money, you know, and he's as happy as Larry, but he's not much good. 50 is not very good. You know what I mean? Put it, he's, he's just not. And, and a lot of these rappers, like, come on. I mean, I don't want to put anyone else on blast, but like, you know, Chingy, you know. <laughs> 
a- any number of rappers, you know? It's yeah, he, he and, and it's it's always an interesting conversation to to think of who you know everyone's like. Well, if he was alive, if Park was alive, he would be down with X, or he would be down with this and that. It's I, I don't know, I don't know that he'd be down with many of them because I don't know that they'd have a career. So, did you ever have a musical talent that made you want to get into music? Never, never in my this this is this is crazy. This is this is a story for the for the for the kids. I was a professional baseball player. Um, and I got signed in, this is in Australia, mind you. And I got signed in the States, came over, played in the States, got injured so badly that I had to reevaluate my career. Now I, I knew nothing but baseball. I did nothing but baseball from when I was oh, 10 to about, you know, well, not even eight till about 17. That's all I did seven days a week. So when I was laid up, I had to sort of reevaluate and I didn't want a real job because no one wants a real job. And I was basically, I used to get, this is a trip too. I used to get the source magazine in Australia ordered in. And at that time when I was, you know, 14, 15, it was $25 an issue every month, but every month it was like the height because it was with all the taxes were crazy. Then every month it was the highlight of my, you know, of my month. we just pouring over the source, every single word, every single, you know, feature. And every, every time I read, you know, I digested a source magazine, I was always obsessed with the gear and the studio, like the, the one paragraph about the studio and the 35 paragraphs about whatever else I didn't care about, but I'd reread and reread the studio. You know, it didn't, at that stage, didn't know what it was, but I just liked the idea of that, you know, the sort of cloak and dagger, what goes on in the studio, you know, the mystique of it. So when it came time to sort of, you know, have a career, I suppose, um, I I chose music, but I dropped out of piano lessons when I was uh, 10 because I hated my teacher um, and had no musical talent whatsoever. I can hand to God, none whatsoever, but I made it my mission in life to compensate for that as quickly as I could and have self-taught since, since then, obviously have self-taught myself, you know, enough, well, enough to, to, to basically, you know, sustain my career. And now, now I can, I can say I can play most things, but at, at the time, like I, I remember I bought, I, <laughs> I bought a drum machine because I kept hearing about the NPCs. And again, in Australia, that was about 25, 27, maybe three grand. I bought this drum machine, had it for two years. No idea what it did, how to make it work, and why the sounds weren't coming out. I had no idea that you had to load sounds. I thought it was broken. I tried to uh, take it back. No idea, none whatsoever what it did. And I bought a, uh, an MS, uh, MS-2000, MS which is a Korg synth. Like It's actually quite dope. I wish I had it now. Um, and couldn't play. So <laughs> I've got a drum machine that I don't know how to work, a synth that I can't play. So it frustrated me to no, absolutely no end. And I was like, you know what? Fuck this. Excuse my French. Fuck this music thing. Like I've got, I've got no idea what I'm doing. Then I went to engineering school. I was like, well, obviously I'm not going to be, you know, I'm not going to be a musician or a, or a producer because I've got no idea what's going on. Um, let me go to engineering school. At least I can still be in the studio then. And then, then it was that was that was the right match. Then I absolutely fell in love with engineering. I'm, I'm an absolute geek for it. Still am to this day. Um, and that was just that was that was what I was meant to. I always thought baseball was the was the way up until obviously I got injured. And as soon as I walked in the studio, it was that was over. That was it. That's what I was meant to do. What was your first gig? Uh the first <laughs> the first big gig that I had because keeping in mind I was coming up in Australia, so you know you don't have the access to artists over there. You know they tour once every three billion years and you know the, the top dogs always always get the gigs because you know they're the top dogs so i was about i think i was 20 and the a canadian band called the tea party um came came into the, the studio that i was working at <laughs> and i was so nervous because that, I, I got the call you know i got the you know it's like they're getting called up to the majors they're like all right cool so you're gonna do tea party today i was like i i'm gonna do I'm going to do what with Tea Party? They're like, well, you, you're going to be recording them. So I remember them, they were really uh, sort of aloof and, you know, a bit rock star-ish, which is fine because they were at that stage. And I was so nervous that I kept smacking myself in the head with the mic stand. I was trying to set up a mic. But still at that point, like, fake it till you make it is completely and utterly uh, was a motto of mine up until I somewhat made it. Um No idea what I was doing. I didn't even know. I was setting up a, a, a guitar mic on the fucking drummer and they could tell 
So the more I could tell that they could tell, the more nervous I got. So I started, <laughs> I started sweating. I kept smacking myself in, in the head with the mic. I, I, I think I hit myself in the head with the mic stand about 13 times. And then finally, when, uh, when you know, the mics, what I thought the mics were run, I couldn't get anything to work. So I just, the very first, like for the first time, I, I was not going to call the senior engineer. I just wasn't going to do it. Stumbled through until one, I think it was the singer, Jeff, came up to me. He goes, you got this. Just relax. And I was like, what? <laughs> relax. I'm, I'm fine. Really, Jeff? Do I have it? All right, cool. And then from that, from then it was cool. From then it was good. But I was, I've never been so nervous in my whole life. And it showed. But uh, after that, of course, I thought I was a rock star. Because, you know, the story, obviously the story that I told was, yeah, they came in, I recorded the hell out of them, you know, we got drunk, and, you know, went and got hookers, and that's not what happened. <laughs> Is that the first song you heard on an album or on the radio? Yeah, yep, yeah, that was, and that's, you know, you see that corny ass scene in, in every movie, that's a really, it's still to this day, it's a really big deal. Like, if something comes on that I've done... Even if it was, you know, it was the smallest thing. If I if I edit it because I edited a million records, you know, like Pro Tools edit, it's still a really big. It's it's a big deal. I don't care what anyone says and how jaded you get. That's a big deal, you know. So that was the first time, and it, and it was it wasn't even uh, major radio in Australia. It was on independent radio on uh, on Triple J, which is like you know PBS over here. But it was still a really big deal. I can feel that sentiment. I can recall seeing one of my interviews on uh, jackthriller.com, and it, it caught me by complete surprise. <laughs> it's, I, I mean, I'm still checking myself that I'm talking to J-Mix right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was, the, that was the first big thing. And then I actually got super lucky after that and engineered one of the biggest selling female pop records in Australian history. Um, right after that so of course i thought i was the shit of course i wasn't i had no idea what i was I still at that stage i had no, no idea what i was doing um and then sort of went st default straight to okay cool so this pond is tiny where are all the real records made where are all the hip-hop records made you know because i was a hip-hop baby since literally since i uh, the first thing i bought with i oh, check this out the first thing that i bought with my own money when i first got an allowance and you know my my mum took me to you know to the shopping center or the mall, like you would say. And she was like, well, you can buy whatever you want. It was Dre Day, the, the CD single of Dre Day, which I think was Death Row's first release ever. And that was the first thing. That was 91, I think that was. That was the first thing I ever bought with my own money. So I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, no kidding. Picture a 10-year-old child buying Easy Does It. Oh, uh, I mean, it's it, I, I conned my mom into one of the trips um, – for, for a baseball, I was over here. We were playing in Colorado, and I conned my mom into buying NWA because I love I love that I love NWA. Um, it conned my mom into buying it for me, and until she heard the lyrics and me, you know, again, it's the same thing. Ten years old reciting, you know, just don't bite it, <laughs> word for word, like literally, not even no, again, no comprehension of what they're talking about. Like you know, and before you know it, splash. I'm like, are they in the pool? What? Why are they? Spl Hold on, wait. They, now they're in the pool what's splashing no idea no idea so that was fun what celebrity were you completely shocked to work with uh bono bono was uh bono was a i was a last minute inclusion on a, a record he did with canine um called bulletproof pride and that was a, that was a big deal that was really cool and ironically enough um we mixed that. I mixed that record in Dre's room at Encore, so that was the first time I'd ever been in his room, and it's. I mean, it's it's fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Um, so that was cool, but that was a big deal. Um, Nas was pretty honestly. Nas was was a big deal only because again, being you know being a hip hop baby, and that's that was sort of you know, I mean you're as old as me. That was kind of our era, you know. That was the for me that was the golden era, and he, he was kind of a big deal. I, I was nervous, you know. Not not nervous, but you know, I did again. It's every single day. I've been doing this for fifteen years. Every single day that I hit record, the first thing I think of is, "Don't fuck this up, don't fuck this up," <laughs> which never happens. But you know, again, I just don't want to replay the tea party scene with you know Nas is there. Nas only it's 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 a trip. He doesn't speak at all unless there's something to say. So you know, we did two songs with him. Um, I did Roses, the song called Roses, off. Uh, uh, is it called Life is Good, I think? 
yeah, the song Roses was dope. I, yeah. Now, I've got to ask you about working with Nas, because I know you're a Tupac fan. Did you have any apprehension or misconceptions on going into the session? Honestly, I, I haven't told many people this, but I've worked with a lot of those cats from the East. Like, I, I, I did a record with Diddy, uh, or Puff, or whatever he, what his, his name was. And I, ha I have to admit, like, professionalism wins for me, but they're, in the back of my mind, I was like, Puffy. But... <laughs> But but you, you can't do that. Like professionally, you can't do it. And honestly, this is on record, Puff. If you hear it, he was very 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 cool to me. He bought me my first Roscoe's chicken and waffles because I, I had no idea what that meant. And he was like, "Yo, you want you want, you want some you want some Roscoe's?" I was like, uh, "I don't know what those words mean." And he's like, "What? I'm not going to do the accent." He's like, "You don't know what the what are you talking about?" All right, just get the white boy. Hey, white boy, what do you want? No, you know what? Get the white boy. What 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 I get? It's cool. And then we, I swear to God, we sat there, and he sat like an eager child next to me, staring at me, going, "It's good, right? It's good, huh?" That, that was my first Roscoe's experience, and I don't think I've had it since. But that was he was he was cool. He was really cool. Once again, this is JMix here, and I'd like to thank all my YouTube subs and viewers for checking out part one of my exclusive interview with Grammy-nominated engineer Jared Scott. In the next segment of the interview, we'll talk about his work on Detox and his relationship with Johnny J. I'll see everybody on the next upload. One love, everybody. A JMix exclusive. What up, we shut up.